wait another moment or so, um, that apparently during this time of the pandemic, uh, people are doing this thing called video bombing. Uh, they're coming into uh, Zoom conferences uh, where they're not invited and disrupting it in certain high tech ways. So Don is checking on each person coming in to make sure they're identified, uh, which is why I'm waiting another moment or else we can't do that. Um, so I'll wait another moment, let the calls die down or the new people die down um, or, or the coming in die down, not the people, and, uh, and then we'll start. Do we want to discuss the schedule at the beginning or the end? I'm sorry, say that again, Gail? Do we want to discuss the schedule for which chapters will be which weeks? Oh, I, I put that at the end. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll go through the whole thing momentarily. Okay, I think you can start. Okay, uh, terrific. Well then, uh, so, um, so Gail, you, you gave it to me, right? There's nothing yep. you need to do up front. Nope, go ahead. Okay. So, so first, I would like to do a sound check. If you could hear me, give me a thumbs up. Thumbs up. <laughs> Terrific. Okay, that is the aerobic portion uh, of the day. I hope that woke you up. Um, the, uh, I may ask for a few more thumbs at some other points. So first, I want to welcome everybody um, to this session of the uh, Citizens for Global Solutions World Citizen Virtual Book Club. Um, I especially want to in, uh, welcome the new members here. We have quite a few. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Bob Flax, and uh, I'm the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions. And before we begin, I just want to take a moment to point out the obvious, uh, that we're meeting in an extraordinary time at this point. Uh, like me, I, I assume that most of you, if not all of you, are under stay-at-home orders. Uh, as the death toll continues to rise in the United States and around the world. And what I'd like to do is just take a moment of silence, um, both to acknowledge the suffering and loss that any of you may have experienced, or the and also to acknowledge the question we have, uh, to be able to meet together at a time like this, discuss uh, these issues. Oh, Don, I see your hand. Donna? You are breaking up. Did, did other people have trouble hearing Bob for a minute or yes. is it just me? Yes. yes, they're all nodding. So oh. um, are you, did you take your phone off of your Wi-Fi? I'm not using my phone because of that problem. I'm just using the computer audio. And if, if everyone oh. hear themselves too. No, that's a problem. If you use your phone off the Wi-Fi, usually okay. it works better. But, okay. but I keep going until it's a problem. Go ahead. Let's try it. Okay. I, am I back now okay? Yeah. Okay. If yep. it gets unstable again, I'll take a moment and switch to the phone. Okay. So, so as I was saying, I would like to take a moment of silence um, to acknowledge both the suffering and the loss that some of you may have had, as well as the folks around the world, and also to acknowledge our good fortune in being able to meet together at a time like this to discuss the, the, this approach to hopefully preventing future suffering of various kinds. So if you would join me in just a moment of silence, we'll take about 10 seconds. Okay, thank you. So I have a, a few housekeeping matters uh, that I need to go over uh, before we dive in. So first, I know there are a number of you that are new to Zoom or not as familiar with Zoom. So I want to point out a couple of things so that you can operate in this environment. So first, if you would take your cursor and put it over your picture, you will see on the upper right hand portion uh, of, your, of your photo, uh, there's a thing that says either mute or unmute. If you would push that, it will switch to the other. Uh oh. Bob, you hit mute. Bob, you hit mute. I hit mute <laughs> Thank too. <you>. Yeah, <laughs> very good. So it, it works. So if you would all push that and push it again, you will get muted and unmuted. So just take a moment to locate that and do that. And then I'm going to ask you to stay on mute for the time of the presentation. Thank you. 
Bob, you might ask if everybody is is in gallery view. Sometimes people come in and only next. see speaker. I'm doing that next. Okay. But if they're not in gallery view, they can't see their picture. Oh, okay, great. So the next thing I'm going to have you do, which is Donna pointed that out, should be the first thing, is if you go to the upper right hand portion of your screen, you'll see it'll say either speaker view or gallery view. Okay? Whatever it says, if you would push that so that you have the other view, you will see in speaker view, you just see the speaker. And in gallery, view, or you see whoever's making noise. And then in gallery view, if you switch to that, you'll see everybody. We happen to have, uh, do we have, no, we have enough just to fill one screen. So take a moment to switch back and forth between speaker view and gallery view. Some people prefer one or the other or to go back and forth during the during this. So that's the second thing I want to point out. Okay. The final thing regarding uh, zoom is if you take your cursor all the way to the bottom. Um, there will be another set of options that pop up and if you push chat. You will see on the right hand side. There is a chat box that pops up. And during that, if we're having a discussion, and let's say there's an article that you know about that you think, ah, terrific, uh, David demonstrated. If you think there's an article, for example, that, that handles this point, you know, fabulously, you can type that in there. Uh, I'm going to put the discussion questions in there later. Um, so that and if, if there's a technical problem and you can't hear, you could write that in there. And I've asked Donna to monitor the chat box. So if there's a problem, she could bring that to our attention, even if you're in mute. Okay. So those are the three items I'd like to point out regarding um, the regarding Zoom. So if we would hit record now, um, we will start recording. And this is being recorded, just to let everyone know. So folks who are interested who can't be here can participate. Okay, so welcome again. I, I want to- Lee Davis just joined us. Lee, Lee Davis just joined us. Thanks. Oh, hello. Okay. So, um, so you should have gotten three items in, in, in one of the emails or in several of the emails from Gail. Uh, you should have a PDF for the book. Um, you should have a, a separate uh, PDF with chapter nine, a later addition to the book, an update to the book. And you should have David Orton's wonderful summary of the book. So if you found out uh, through our emails, you will have those three. You may not have noticed them, but you can go find them afterward. I want to take a moment. Uh, the last thing to do is to thank uh, McFarlane, the publisher, uh, for giving us the link to the PDF. I want to thank David Orton for his wonderful summary, which he's making available to all of you. I want to thank Tom Hastings for doing all the tech stuff to get those PDFs up um, so they can be sent to you. Uh, I want to thank Gail for doing a terrific job for managing the book club. And finally, I want to thank Ron uh, for writing such a wonderful book and for being such a teacher and mentor um, throughout decades of his career. So thank, thanks to all, all of those people. Okay. So with that, um, I will ask you to remain on mute throughout the presentation. I'm going to push a button or two to share my screen and get the, uh, get the slideshow up. Okay. Oh, that's right. Someone pointed out to me, I forgot to say that if you're only on the phone, you would be muted um, by hitting star six and unmuted by hitting star six. And let me see if I had any other things for the phone I wanted to say. No, that's it. Okay. Terrific. Um, all right, so give me a moment and I will get the slideshow up. Uh, stop the share screen. Okay, that one. We have another person who joined us by iPad. Okay. Great time to join because I'm f fiddling with stuff. Yeah. Okay. Hi, could, could the new person uh, identify themselves, please? So person who just joined from an iPad. Oh, I'm on mute. Could the person who just joined from the iPad please identify oh, themselves? Thank you. 
I think it's just me because I was trying to get my video. My camera wasn't on, so I have my camera back on now. Oh, and who are you? Oh, that's Jim again. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Great. And if Donna, we, if you would stay off mute so that if people put stuff in the chat box, if they can't see or hear or whatever, uh, you could let me know. Okay. The rest of you yeah. would stay on mute. So if your dog starts barking or your spouse says you haven't taken out the garbage recently, uh, we won't all hear that. Okay. So um, if anybody, if everyone could see the screen, if you'd give me a thumbs up, the first slide. <laughs> Terrific. Okay, good. A little more aerobics. Okay, so um, welcome to this presentation of the first two chapters of World Federation, a critical analysis of world federal government by Ron Glossop. Okay. Oh, let me get the right button here. Okay. Okay. So um, we're going to cover this book over several sessions. What I'm going to do today is say a few words about Ron to start with. Uh, then I'll give a very brief overview of the entire book. Um, then uh, do a deeper dive into the first two chapters. Um, I will say as I go through the chapters, I'm not going through them from the perspective of trying to teach everything in the books. Instead, I'm just going, giving a brief outline of the topics of the book um, so that if you read it already, it'll bring what's in the first two chapters back uh, into short-term memory. Or if you haven't read it, hopefully it will entice you uh, to reading the book after this session. So that'll be the first two chapters. Then we'll uh, go into the questions and discussion. And then I'll give it back to Gail, who will uh, talk about the schedule and the, uh, on who our next presenters will be. So with that, let me say a few words about Ron. Uh, if you're on the phone, by the way, and I have, if I'm showing a picture or an image, I'll describe what that image is. So first there's a picture of Ron, for those of you who are on the phone. Um, uh, Ron Glossop is a retired professor of philosophy. Uh, he's been the president of our CGS chapter in St. Louis for years, if not decades. And those of you that know Ron uh, know that he's also been a proponent and activist with the language Esperanto. Um, in addition to the, this current book we're looking at, he's also written the books uh, Confronting War, an Examination of Humanity's Most Pressing Problem, and Philosophy, an Introduction to Its Problems and Vocabulary. And what I'm gonna do after each portion is I'm gonna, since Ron, since we're fortunate enough to have Ron with us, I'm gonna to turn to him and ask if there's anything he wants to add. So Ron, if there's anything else you want us to know about you um, or your, your career background, um, now's the time. Well, you have done a very nice summary. I don't think I need to add anything. Great, and, and Ron, I'll check in with you at the end of each chapter to see if there's anything you wanted to add or highlight. Okay. Fine. Great. So the book itself. So for those on the phone, I have a, a photo of the book up um, and also the table of contents. So as you see, it's in several different colors, kind of approximating the organization of the book. Uh, the first three chapters essentially lays the groundwork and foundation uh, for the whole book. And like I said, we'll be doing the first two today. Um, the chapters four, five, and six is really the heart of the book, as I see it. Um, it's probably, it's perhaps the most thorough presentation uh, of the case for a World Federation, as well as the arguments against it, and then the counter arguments of World Federalists um, to those initial arguments. So that's the heart of the book. And then building on that, he goes into um, the, the paths to reaching a World Federation and, um, and a summary and observations then the book itself was written in 1993. He wrote an update in 2000. Uh, so that's what we're calling here chapter nine. So that's in a separate PDF. So that's the overall uh, arc of our presentations for the next couple of months. I, um, you're, you're lucky if you have chapters four, five, and six, if you'll be presenting that, because that's the juicy part. Uh, this is the less juicy part <laughs> that we're doing today. So, um, so first, chapter one, the introduction. Uh, Ron begins by talking about two great transitions 
I'm going to stop and let Donna check in whoever just arrived. Um, I'm not seeing a new person because oh, okay. uh, now that you've taken the screen, I can't oh, see everything right. Right. as easily. We'll, we'll but just... I don't see it. I don't see anybody new. Great. Okay. I'm just hearing bells. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So Ron begins by talking about two great transitions. The first, he talks about the enormous changes that have happened in the last 150 years, like the harnessing of electricity, the mass production and distribution of food, our transportation system, communication. And then he kind of segues into talking about the focus of this book when he talks about the size of political communities themselves. Um, then from that, he, talk, he expands out to talking about the last 5,000 years, where we went from city-states to having them conquer each other and forming empires, uh, moving to nation-states, and then to the, essentially, the next tran two transitions, the focus of this book, going to internationalism and then to globalism, and spend some time uh, going into more depth there. He mentions the triggers, he mentions a few of the triggers in that move from international to globalism as having been things like those initial astronaut photos uh, of the Earth from space, uh, being able to switch on your TV set and seeing television from around the world and our environmental crisis. And to that, we could add today the, the pandemic as well. So that's shift to thinking globally. Okay. And then he poses the question that, you know, with all of this shifting going on, um, that wouldn't institutional changes uh, be necessary to go along with them? At that point, he uh, introduces the analogy uh, from the US history of our moving from a confederation of 13 sovereign states to a federation of the United States of America. And he, he, he then states, as, as we know, one of the central arguments in, um, in our movement is why not do that at the world level, making one final leap. Um, then he introduces the idea of a world parliament. And he says that if there were such an entity, it would consider issues from the perspective of what's good for the world rather than America first or any particular country first. And in that system, you have world law that's enforced on individuals, not nations. And later, the book goes into much more depth on this. And national armies um, would then become unimportant. And then ask the questions, well, how would this be done with the fact that there are so many problems and challenges like differences of language, culture, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Then he segues to talking about there being great interest in this after World War II, but the Cold War pushed the discussion of world government into the background. However, in the post Cold Cold War period, there's renewed interest, and then he talks a little bit about Gorbachev uh, talking about establishing some type of world government, a governance structure. And, and then, again, remembering this book was written in 1993, he says that the memory of World War II is now largely gone, uh, so the motivation for World Federation does not seem to be there in the same way it was. And then ends that chapter by saying that we must think clearly about the pros and cons of having a democratic World Federation, which essentially is what the book is dedicated to. So that's my overview of the introduction. I want to turn back to Ron to see, uh, Ron, if there's anything you want to add or emphasize or highlight from chapter one. That was a wonderful summary. I would like to add a couple of points. The idea of the two great transitions is something that I got from a book, the most important book I've ever read in my life by Kenneth Boulding, B-O-U-L-D-I-N-G. It's called The Meaning of the 20th Century. And it is a monumental book because it not only gives a wonderful summary of the whole of human history, 
but it also focuses on the contemporary problems and what's going to happen in the future. So it is a wonderful book. I strongly recommend it. Even though it was published in 1964, it's hardly outdated. It's a wonderful book to read to get an overview of human history. Secondly, I do want to mention that although I'm particularly interested in the analogy of the United States moving from a confederation to a federation, and that's what I focused on in that book, I do think it's important for everyone to recognize that Switzerland did the same thing about the same time. And it was more amazing for Switzerland because they didn't even have a common language. But they still made the move from cantons, a confederation of cantons, to a federation. And they had the exact experience of going from a situation of war to a situation of peace as a result of making that change from a confederation to a federation. Finally, I just want to point out that this book was translated into Esperanto by a friend of mine, Johanno Rapley, a European, originally British, and then lived in France. He translated the book into Esperanto. The title in Esperanto is Monda Federatio. That's how you say World Federation in Esperanto. And I am just very grateful to Johanna Rapley for doing that translation. It's very interesting that although my English language book did not get reviewed anywhere that I know of, there have been two or three reviews in Esperanto to the Esperanto translation. <laughs> well, that's it for me. Great. Th thank you so much, Ron. And I also just want to thank you for continuing to be such a wonderful teacher and inspiration to the, the entire World Federalist community. Okay. So moving into chapter two. Um, so, so in chapter two, like any good philosopher, um, Ron starts by um, giving basic definitions to our basic concepts that we'll be using. And he says, he starts off by saying that if we're going to talk about a democratic federal world government, it's important to unpack that and to look at what those different concepts mean. So he goes into these four, he goes into government, democracy, world government, and federation, and let's follow along. <laughs> so first is government. So he mentions that government exists at every level of society, whether you look at towns, cities, countries, states, and nations. Uh, they're used to handle problems that people cannot solve on their own. Uh, governments are able to do that by collecting taxes, which support their activities, and that governments have many functions. And then he lists the most prominent ones. So first of all, that they maintain law and order within a, a given society. Um, that they protect against the tax from other societies. And when you're taking this, looking at it at the national level, that's what's called national defense. That they provide goods and services that are not provided by businesses. Uh, that they protect the public from dangers not easily detected. Um, and, you know, right now in the middle of the pandemic, uh, we've heard a lot of debate around that key point of whether our government did the right moves to protect us. They redistribute wealth to alleviate dire need. Oops, and that's it. That, 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 that's his list from that chapter. Okay, moving on to democracy. Um, Ron begins by pointing out that most governments throughout history have been autocratic or tyrannical. They've not been democratic. So that's a uh, kind of recent invention and, and a rarity throughout history. Um, then he gets into a little discussion of representative democracy versus direct democracy. Uh, for those who are not familiar with those terms, representative democracy is what we have in the United States when we elect representatives. Uh, but if you're in a state like California, uh, where we have referendums on various things, 
that's an example of direct democracy. Uh, if an entire nation was a direct democracy, uh, essentially we, each person would be voting on everything uh, rather than sending representatives to do it. And there are variations of that. Uh, actually, one of the questions later addresses that. Uh, then some characteristics, characteristics of a democracy is they follow majority rule. Um, that typically they, have, they allow for freedom of speech, association, dissent, and have free public education. That the representatives have power for a limited period of time. It's not a lifetime appointment. That anyone who meets certain criteria can be part of the government. Bob, you're breaking uh, up a little. Is by secret ballot. Okay, I'll give it a second. How is it now? It's Am okay now. Okay, terrific. Yes, you're back. Terrific, thank you. Uh, that the voting is by secret ballot, so there's no intimidation uh, in that process. And that the uh, powers of government are limited by a written constitution. So those are the main characteristics of democracy that Ron points out in that chapter. Then, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's a little more. <laughs> there are checks and balances to make sure that, um, that all the, the main principles are followed and that no one part uh, you know, rules the others. And then he says that making democracy work is not easy. And he concludes by saying that the first few years uh, of a new democracy are critical uh, as to whether it will continue to unfold that way. And you may be aware of many, many comments uh, that George Washington in the United States could have been a king if he wanted to. He was so popular. Uh, but by his wisdom and good graces, he stepped down and really setting the role model uh, for the peaceful transition of power in a democracy. Okay, moving on to world government. So as Ron says, a world government would serve the same functions as a government at any level, except for item two, the protection from other societies. And of course, that's presuming that all societies would be part of the world government. So only if we were attacked by Martians uh, or where, wherever they came from, uh, we would need that, that function. Okay. Um, then he lists a few um, items, you know, re basically repeats some of the same items, but raises it to the global level. So there would be the preservation of law and order for the whole world. So some type of legislature would be needed. And that part of the book has a nice detailed discussion of this. So I just want to highlight that if people want to go to that. And then, of course, it would need a world constitution as well. Okay. Then the uh, providing goods and services for the community, not taken care of by others because there's no short-term profit to be gained. And one example he gives in the book is space exploration. Uh, now, of course, there's a company or two getting into that business, but it most likely wouldn't be started by a company. It's just beyond their scope. Uh, three that protecting the public from dangers not easily detected, things like climate change, pandemics, et cetera, et cetera. Of four, redistributing wealth to alleviate situations of dire need. And if you remember our last book, uh, Juncker's book on the uh, history of the idea of world government, uh, he talked about the global Marshall Plan. Uh, so that would be an example of how that could be done. And, um, and those are the characteristics that Ron points out for world government, or the ones he highlights, I should say. Then moving on to federation, um, Ron talks about three different ways that nations can cooperate. Um, the first is if they were to merge and form a single larger, what, what's called a unitary state. So that's one way. Um, the other way is by the kind of the other extreme is by keeping all aspects of their sovereignty, uh, but meeting to cooperate on different points. So that's a confederation and the example of that we are most familiar with or many of us are familiar with is the UN. And then a middle ground, 
um, of a federal system where the nations would, of the world would federate and form a world federation. Okay. Then Ron presents uh, this chart here, uh, which is on page 29 of his book, uh, where he compares side by side a confederation or a league uh, to a federation or a union. So let's uh, take a look at that. So on the uh, confederation side, that each member state retains its complete sovereignty, having its own in independent armed forces, and a as opposed to a federation or league where there's split sovereignty, that member states possess authority in some areas, while mm -hmm. other powers are delegated to the central federal government, in this case, central federal world government. Next, that each member state has the right in a country went out again right to draw at any time okay i'll uh, wait a minute is, uh, am i back you're back okay that's what happens when you live out in the country <laughs> basically so um okay so for a confederation each member state has a right to withdraw at any time for any reason and in a federation no succeeding from the union is allowed. The commitment is to stay in the central organization. Okay. Next, in a federation or league, individual citizens like you and I of the member states have no right to interact with the central organization. Whereas in a federation or union, individual citizens may interact with the central government in those areas where it has authority, such as, for example, electing representatives to the World Parliament. Next, in a confederation, individual citizens of member states cannot be arrested or tried by the central organization or its officials. Whereas in a federation, individual citizens can be tried as individuals in, in world federal courts for violating federal laws and in state courts for violating state laws. And as you know, this is one of the things that made the International Criminal Court such a game changer in world law, uh, that they were, it's an attempt to establish the individual citizen accountability for the most heinous crimes. Next that in a confederation, the primary loyalty of citizens is to their own state, and there's no expectation of loyalty to the central organization, where in a federation, the primary loyalty is to the central federal government, while secondary loyalty is to one state or province, which is permissible. Next, in a confederation, all financial resources for the central organization come as contributions from the member states. And we have learned with the UN how problematical that can be. Whereas in a federation, the central federal government has its own independent sources of revenue, including authority to tax individuals. And as we discussed during the last book, there are a number of, of of proposals that have put together of how to fund a world federation and the taxing individuals is, is one of several. So with that, I want to uh, return to Ron to see if there's any points that he wants to make or emphasize from chapter two. Oh, Ron, take it away. Well, thank you for, uh, Dan, a wonderful, wonderful review of the book. You've just made it, done a very good job of pointing out the important things. I would only add a couple of points. One is that we are used to the idea that the main thing with government is that you have laws. But you need to distinguish between two parts of that process. One is making laws, the legislative part, and the other part is enforcing laws. That is making sure that people who don't buy it, who don't obey the laws are in some way or another punished and they are therefore motivated individually to obey the laws. And of course, as was pointed out by 
<clears throat> by Bob, and, and rightly so, the International Criminal Court is exactly where we're running into problems right now because the government of the United States and the government of China and the government of Russia do not like the idea of an international criminal court that can take action against individual citizens. And so that's how the, the Nuremberg trials after World War II and then the Tokyo trials started us on that road to persecution of individuals with regard to the beginnings and the carrying out of wars. And so the International Criminal Court is absolutely critical for the movement from a confederation to a federation. One other point I'd like to make that I didn't really make in the book, but which has come up in recent discussions about the movement from where we are now to a world government, is a distinction between evolution and revolution. Evolution is gradual change, a little bit of a change at a time, and the possibility even of reversing it for a little bit, if you want to, and then continuing again. So evolution is the way of democracy. Revolution, on the other hand, means making a radical change, and usually in one that's not easy to undo. <laughs> It might be undone eventually, but it might it probably would require violence to uh, undo a revolution. So I think those terms, evolution and revolution, are extremely important as we think about how to move from where we are now to a completely different kind of world. Finally, I want to make a comment I should have made at the very beginning, and that is how this book, World Federation, is different from another book that I'm very interested in promoting, and that is Confronting War. The World Federation book really comes out of when I debated as a high school debater in 1947, most people don't realize that in 1946-47, that was a high school debate topic throughout the whole country, that the U.N. should be converted into a democratic world government. And that was the experience I had debating as a freshman that got me on the road to being a world federalist, which I've been ever since then. So the, the thing I want to note is that there's a, a difference between going from the conclusion, like I did in the World Federation book, and then starting with a problem, which uh, I did in the Confronting War book. I thought it would be more effective rather than starting with my conclusion about what ought to be done that it would be more effective to give a presentation starting with a problem that needs to be solved and then adopting a problem-solution approach. The World Federation book is already voting, already focused on the arguments about what needs to be done and how to do it uh, and what is the best way to get a federation. The other is to start with the problems. Now, obviously, there's more than the war problem, but the war problem is not just the problem of war. It's a problem of divided sovereignty. It's the problem of anarchy. And I think it's a word that we need to use more often. We would not tolerate anarchy in our local communities, in our state communities, in our national community. The Ridiculous thing is that we seem that we seem to think we need to tolerate it at the global level. Now, of course, there's been historical changes. At one time, the idea of world government was just unrealistic. But times have changed. That's an important part of our message, that we are no longer living in the 8th century. 
<laughs> and we are not any longer even living in the 20th century. We are now living in the 21st century, and it's time to make the transition from internationalism to globalism, from thinking that everybody has to be a member of a nation state, and the only way the world gets together is through the national governments at an organization like the League of Nations or the United Nations, and going to the idea that, hey, we're all members of the world community, we ought to be able to have a government for the whole world. And as I already noted, another important part of that, I think, is a global language. If you're going to have democracy, you've got to be able to talk with each other. There's no doubt that at the moment, English is becoming a global language. But remember, at the time of World War I, French had that status. And in fact, it was in the League of Nations that the very first resolution in the assembly of the League of Nations was that all of the children of the world should be taught the world language Esperanto. But because it was a confederation in the League of Nations, everything had to be done unanimously, even in the assembly. And it was the French that defeated the Esperanto idea, even though there was a much a great deal of support for it, especially from the Japanese and and also from Mexico. There was a huge support for the Esperanto idea, but the French were able to stop it because it was a confederation, and the French said, we, we don't need a world language. We already have one. We have French. And I'm uh, sorry that many people are thinking the same way now about English. They don't realize how difficult English is for people who are not native speakers of the language. It's just not logical. It's not a system where the, the spoken language and the written language go together like they do in Esperanto. Well, that's enough. I'll get off my, off my soapbox. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, yes, Donna? I, I just have one housekeeping thing. I've been asked to mute all the, the people on phone because there is some um, uh, uh, sound coming in. So those of you on the phone, if you want to speak, remember you have to hit star six. Thank great, you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, so thank you so much, Ron. And I want to add a, a, a PS to what Ron was saying about Esperanto because whenever he mentions it, I add this point, and, and Iran basically agrees, um, that Esperanto, that, that a proposal is that Esperanto, that, well, let me start again, that nations could still have their national languages, but Esperanto be taught as a second language. So if everyone in the world has that as their second language, and of course a nation may want to adopt it as their first, but if everyone had that as their second language, then we could all communicate freely to each other and countries could still maintain their national language. So I, I think Ron, you um, agreed with that every time I spoke with you. So uh, anyway, so I wanted to add that to yeah, the conversation. Yeah, yes, I do. And I think that's also a very important point with regard to what we world federalists say, we have to make it clear that we're not trying to eliminate the national governments. We are in favor of preserving the national governments, but subordinating them to the world government. We are not talking about a unitary world government that could readily become a dictatorial government. And that's why it's important to recognize that's also the case for Esperanto, not to eliminate the national languages, but in fact to help preserve the minor languages from the major languages. Great. Thank you again so much, Ron. Okay, so that concludes the presentation portion, chapters one and two. And now, oh, yes, Donna? Well, no, I have a discussion point, but I have a question or a comment burning in my heart, but I can wait. I didn't. Go ahead. Okay, I'll go through the ground rules for the discussion, and then you can jump in. Okay. Okay. So, a, a few, so there's a few ground rules we need to follow to be able to manage this number of people having a discussion remotely. So, so first of all, if you're on the video, it's fine if you raise your hand. So you know, just make sure it's in front of the camera 
rather than raising it high where we don't see it. So raise your hand in front of the camera. And if you're on the phone, uh, you would need to unmute yourself and then say your name. So if I wanted to, if I was on the phone, I would say Bob Stack, which means it's our shorthand for I want to get in the stack. And then we will um, put you in the stack. So that's how you, how you get into the conversation. Um, you'll have two minutes to make your comments. At the end, uh, after a minute and a half, uh, I will say uh, 30 seconds, reminding you that, that you're coming to the end of your time. Then I'll say time. It doesn't mean you need to stop mid-word or mid-sentence. Mid Please finish your sentence. Uh, but that's how we'll manage getting all the people in or as many as possible. Um, also, um, we like to call on everybody uh, a first time before we call, you know, before we call anyone for a second time to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. Uh, so even if you have your hand up uh, quickly, uh, you may not be called on right away if you were called on before. And lastly, um, there's, I'm going to we lost you again, Bob. We'll, we'll start with those. Okay, I'll, I'll be quiet for a moment. Okay. You're back. Am I back? Am I back? Good. So, yes, um, yes. So we will, um, yeah, so I'll, we'll start with those discussion questions. We have a little more than a half hour. Uh, I'm actually going to stop at about 10 to the, uh, about 10, 20, my time. Uh, so we have some time for business at the end. Uh, and I think that's, um, yes, that's it. So I'm going to go, um, no, I'll put, I'll put them up first. Then I'm going to go off screen share and so we could all see each other and go back to regular full screen. So, um, so the, the three discussion questions, I'm going to put up three right out of the text. And then um, whoever gets called on first could pick whichever one they want to start with. We'll stick with that one for a few minutes then we'll switch to a second, then we'll switch to a third, and then, uh, and then floors open for anything else that's not one of the questions. So the three are as follows. First, having to do with representation to a World Federation. And, and essentially, in, in a number of models of World Federation, the US style of representation has been um, used as an example, where you have like a house of representatives that's proportional to the number of people in a country. And then you'd have a Senate uh, or whatever it's called where you might have one, two or three parliament ministers uh, going to the Senate. Um, but as our uh, colleague, Joe Schwartzberg used to point out that is that Senate part or whatever we call it, is that fair? When you have, for example, China with 1.4 billion people versus Vatican City of a thousand people. Those are the two extremes. <laughs> So even if China had three, you know, parliament ministers in that Senate-like body and the Vatican City had one, uh, is that fair? Uh, Joe liked to point out Tuvalu. Uh, he picked on them. They had they have 38,000 people. And he said, you know, should Tuvalu have one representative and China have three? Uh, is that fair? So should we use the U.S. model in that way or is another model necessary? That's where you get into things like weighted voting and other issues. Then secondly, types of democracy. Uh, some people claim that representative democracy is an outmoded form. And instead with the internet and all, we should strive for direct democracy. And there are a number of variations on that, which I know some people here uh, in this call are aware of. Um, so what do you think about that? Um, should we, you know, is, is a world parliament of elected representatives something we should strive for? Or should it, we have another type of democracy that's more, quote, representative democracy? And last but not least, bringing it right home to us is uh, if, if focusing on the advantages of a world federation, is what advantages would a world federation provide in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, or a future pandemic if we were uh, to have a World Federation at that time. So I'm going to take those questions and I'm going to put them in the chat box. That'll take me a moment to do. Um, but I saw, um, so the way I'll do this is whoever starts first can pick whichever question they want to speak to. So just give me a moment. I'm going to take it off screen share. 
And I'm going to close uh, that for now. And I'm going to take the questions and put them in the chat box. Hold on a second. Uh, copy. Okay. I'll put here and edit paste. Okay. Great. The questions are now in the chat box. Um, so now I will take hands and take a stack. And if you're on the phone and you want to jump in, you could do that. So show of hands. I see Arthur. Um, I see uh, Father Ben. Okay, I have, we're on two screens now. We have so many people, so I need to check the second screen. Hands up. Okay, anybody those on Those of the you phone? on phone, yeah, those of you on phone, okay, or, on phone? or without a video. Stack? or without a video, they okay. have to speak up too. Yes, anyone <laughs> want to get in the snack? Okay, we'll start with uh, the folks who uh, have their hands up first. So Arthur and then Father Ben. So Arthur, you can uh, pick your question and we'll stay with that for a few moments. You're on mute, Arthur. You got to go off mute. Extraordinary job, uh, you know, for everyone who's worked on this, but especially for Ron, it's a fabulous book, and the and the author intro. get closer to the microphone. It's still hard to hear. Oh, it's still hard to hear. May yeah, I stay it, on it's the very phone? soft. Okay, let me. Uh, I'll tell you what. Take somebody else for the question, and I'll I'll do my voice by phone. Is this clear now or not? It, it, it's it's yes. clear enough. Close enough for yeah. world government work, like I like to say. <laughs> okay, all right, because I can switch to phone audio, which is stronger. Um, is so okay. anyway, uh, what? This is okay, go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Uh, well, first of all, extraordinary book, very well-written intro, very compelling, uh, and also very relevant uh, currently was his point that people in the World Health Organization, doesn't matter if they're probably said from Venezuela, France, or Japan, they don't see themselves as working for one country, uh, even if, and if their country's doing something wrong, they want them to be fixed as much as anyone else. So basically a very timely example with the World Health Organization. Um, I would just add the, 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 the comment that I want to make is on the direct democracy side, which is uh, obviously direct democracy. There was just one person, one vote around the world would be a disaster. It'd be mob rule. We see how the mobs get played uh, with uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but we also, uh, I'm sorry, Arthur, would everyone please mute your phones? We're hearing ringing in the background. I can't. Yeah. You hit the little, some mutes are up the upper side, some are lower left, but the little microphone. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. Um, so I was just saying that, uh, uh, but then now there are like, the thing that we're, we're working on, I'd love to explore is what, uh, and then maybe there's separate discussion more is what Gary Davis was talking about is that we don't have to just make it mob rule or you know, the old ideas that in this internet era, incredible new things are happening. I mean, here we're having Zoom calls, all of the world, people doing classes this way. There's so many incredible things happening and each has problems that we then work out, the, the Zoom bombing, whatever else, and we figure out how to handle that. But, you know, we can emerge to a new system where we work on bringing to the top the highest and best wisdom of all humanity, where, and, and, and by the way, it goes with everything. I mean, if you have a world parliament, if you have a representative democracy, we still need a way that the will of the people can start getting uh, expressed directly at the global level. And it has to be something that really does. And there's so many techniques now that can do it that starts bringing to the top the best and the highest wisdom. I mean, you look at Google where, and in, in, in before you even finish typing your phrase, it's 30 all seconds. The world. So anyway, just throwing that in to expand uh, direct democracy in a further ongoing discussion to how do we bring to the top uh, the highest and best wisdom of each individual and of all humanity. Okay, thank you, Arthur. So, um, so let, let's stay on that question for a moment. So Father Ben, if you wanted to speak to that, uh, fine, if not, we'll go to you first when we start another question. So Father Ben, was your comment also on the types of democracy issue? Uh, no. No, great. So I'll start with you after we've gone, spend a few minutes on this question. So is there anyone else who would like to speak to or explore that issue of representative democracy versus direct democracy? Raise your hand yeah. if you, yeah. oh, yes, uh, Tom Hastings. Yeah, uh, 
I, th I think Switzerland has a little bit more of a direct democracy than the United States. I, when I was uh, about a couple decades ago, uh, a Swiss representative to our standards organization uh, had to go and vote every two weeks <laughs> uh, on matters of, uh, of for the whole country. So I, I don't know whether they're still doing that, but uh, that was an interesting uh, difference between the Switzerland and the U.S. As Ron pointed out, we evolved about the same time. Thank you. By the way, too, that, that great point. Get, 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 um, sorry, um, get in the stack if you want to be recognized, Gail, you were next. Um, yeah, I think that for uh, a, a world government to be successful in terms of democratic process, it's essential that it be accompanied by very active grassroots participation, which leads me to think that um, direct democracy in, uh, in some form, you know, some degree of that at least, would be very beneficial because that would get people at the grassroots level involved. Great, thank you. And anyone who would like to speak, raise your hand, or if you're on the phone or don't have a video, say your name and stack. Once. Uh, okay, so okay, I will call. I will. Mohammed. Mohammed. Mohammed is unmuted. Mohammed, did you want to say something? Yes. Yes, please. I just wanted to uh, refer to a really short uh, thing. It's I think uh, whether it's a representative democracy or a direct de democracy. I think as um, I think as a migrant now in the U.S. Uh, the main problem is the uh, community internal conflicts between races. I think if we are trying to, or, or if there is a thought of uh, uh, establishing an, um, a fair world federal system, I think this should be depending on fair representation. Uh, especially, um, I think one of the main things that should be uh, organized around is uh, racism. Racism can be a really uh, bad disease, um, um, if, um, which which probably can lead into. Uh, uh, I think I think the fear, the fear of uh, a dictatorship, uh, has always uh, exists. As uh, I came from a country where it's actually ruled by a military dictator. So the fear of having a dictatorship among uh, the uh, World uh, Federation uh, system uh, can be, uh, this is something can happen through racism inside communities. I'm just talking as a migrant who is actually facing hardships probably like every and every single day on the way that people talk or the way that, or or the, uh, or the way people think, or even like when you leave out of your house, like you're under a judgment every single moment. How can we get those migrants to understand that uh, the solution to racism can, 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 um, can happen through the World Federation system? That's my thought. Great. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Anyone else want to get in the stack? Okay, I'll put myself in. Um, I, let me just re reset my time. Um, okay, um, I, I just want to say that I, I don't see that in this stage of our evolution, uh, getting rid of a world parliament. I, I, I still think that will be an essential part of this. I do think, though, that with the wonders of the internet and instant communications, that the parliamentarians could take these now instant polls of their region or their countries or whatever it is and get much more information that, that they can bring to, the, to bear, not only on voting yes or no on an issue, but also brainstorming solutions and things like that. And just like NGOs have a status or can have status with the UN, uh, that other kinds of organizations and other kinds of cultures and men and women, I mean, different kinds of groupings could have ways into that participatory process that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, so I'm not, I, I don't see us getting rid of a parliament, uh, but I do see that there's more 
more avenues for participation than just that. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else uh, on this issue before we switch? Going once, going twice. Uh, Perfect. Thank you all. I will. Okay, Tom, you're still on this. Uh, yes, I. Go ahead, uh, Tom. I was wondering. One of the things that the, our constitution didn't really address is corporations. And I don't know whether corporations deserve to have representation or not, but uh, in, in, in the government, or, uh, um, but we're also debating as to whether they are individuals or have the rights of individuals or, or what. But Great, thank you for question. bringing that up. I'm, I'm going to take one, uh, one other comment because that's a whole other topic, we, you know, road we can go down. But I did see Tom Hastings, uh, I'm sorry, Tom Camarillo's hand go up, and then I'll switch to Father Ben for another question. So go um, ahead, Tom Camarillo. Um, I, I do not believe that corporations should be. I think that was a misnomer that the Supreme Court did, and, and it really should not be. And I hope that in the near future we uh, have it. Uh, rescinded in our country. Great. Thank can you, I, Tom. Can, can and I on that, can oh. I say a word? Can uh, I say a Simon, Simonian. Uh, Bob Flax, can I say a word? Yeah, yes, go ahead, Simon. Um, one of the problems, as we all know, is that no world leader uh, can say uh, what we are saying for justice and for democracy. Uh, let's give up uh, what we have, like, like let's say Mr. Putin. For justice and democracy, let's give up what we have and join this uh, 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 World uh, Federa Federation for a Democratic System. Uh, we haven't seen that happen uh, from any world leader or even a religious leader saying like the Pope, uh, let's give up the Catholic system and let's join the world's uh, uh, global religion, for example. Uh, so that is a major problem. And uh, we need to realize that. We are here, you know, uh, people want this federation, world government, democracy. Yes, uh, we are not heads of state to be able to say, I'm giving that up and want to join you here. So that's a problem we have to try and solve somehow. Gorbachev did. Th thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to the second issue. However, I, I will point out, just to speak to that point, that, that that actually is in the Citizens for Global Solutions strategic plan. Uh, it's, we, we have something called the theory of change of how we're going to get the world leaders to do that. But that's a topic for another conversation. Excuse so me, I want to go to Father Ben now. Uh, if everyone the first topic. Themselves, I, uh, Simon, I need to go to Father Ben now and move to another question. It, it, it seems to me that uh, if it's done prudently and with sensitivity, that the, the, the seventh question, namely, how would uh, a world of feder federalism interact with uh, the pandemic, would be a useful point of discussion uh, and perhaps uh, a discussion that could be had even publicly. Great. Thank you. So we're on that question. Anybody have any thoughts that they want to contribute uh, to that issue? How would a World Federation deal? It's kind of the cat's out of the bag now for this pandemic. But how would a World Federation ideally deal with pandemics of the future? Or if we had one now, what would it do? Okay, Simon, then I'll put myself in the queue. Anybody else want to go in the queue before we start calling? Okay, take it away, Simon, then I'll go. Right. Uh, there was a, a disease uh, not long time ago called smallpox. And that has been eradicated. And we need something like that. And I was involved in making that vaccine at the uh, London University in 1950s uh, that was yeah. freeze dried, heat stable, and that was active for one year. So the World Health Organization in Geneva took that vaccine from London University 
and distributed it to all 200 countries. And they, everybody was vaccinated, it took 10 years, 67 to 77. And since then, previously, smallpox killed 4 million people each year. That's 11,000 people each day for 3,000 years from 11, uh, 57 BCE, uh, Ramses V, uh, Pharaoh, died of it in his mummy. There were smallpox pustules on his mummy. And um, so it's been saving now 4 million people each year uh, permanently since 1977. So for this pandemic, COVID-19, we need a similar arrangement where, uh, wherein uh, a vaccine is produced uh, more efficiently these days from what we did in the 1950s, <clears throat> and then use that for a global eradication program of COVID-19. Because <clears throat> even if we get the flat curve here, there is no guarantee that it will not come back as smallpox did year after year for 3,000 years. Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, I put myself in the stack, but is there anybody who also wants to get online? Okay, so uh, hold on, let me just start the timer on myself. Okay, um, yes, okay. The, um, so I, I, I'm- You're frozen, Bob. Write an article on this, which I be. Oh, okay, I'll stop <laughs> for a minute. How is it now? Can you hear me now? Good. Okay. Yes. I'm like that guy in the Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? Okay. So let me start. The, um, so I, I was inspired to write an article on this and I'm in the middle of it now. I'm, I'm going to argue that at every stage from early detection to response uh, to uh, containment, I mean, at every stage of the pandemic, a World Federation has something to contribute. I'll just give one example. Uh, early detection, that from reporting, uh, we've been told that China sat on the news uh, of this, pan you know, of the outbreak and allowed it to grow. We also from reporting have been told that the same thing happened in the United States. Um, when you have sovereignty, they could control information and they can keep things contained for whatever political interests uh, until it gets out of hand. Well, I, I, I'm arguing that the needs of the world um, override, I'll even say Trump, political interests, um, <laughs> and, 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 that, um, and that there needs to be a system, just like every hospital reports to the county in the United States, there needs to be a parallel system where every hospital reports to the world, to the world Health Organization, bypassing the political whims of individual nation states and administrations. And just like in, in intel, the intelligence community has what they call signals intelligence, when there's a lot of 30 seconds, okay, when there's a lot of chatting and stuff around terrorism, um, you know, they, they zero in there. So when there's stuff in outbreak detecting, the world organization could move in, have, have pre-stationed, um, you know, doctors assigned that get called out like out of reserves. Uh, have food and shelter and stuff ready if people need to be quarantined in an area of the outbreak and could prevent outbreaks from becoming pandemics. That an immediate response could have done it. It could have saved, you know, tens of thousands of people worldwide. Um, and, and a world federation could do that. Uh, individual nation states cannot. So um, there's a string of things like that that I'll put in the article. Thank you. Any other, anyone else want to get in the queue on that issue? Next question. Okay. Those of you on the phone or without a video, remember you have to unmute yourself and stack yourself. Just a reminder, because we can't hear you. <laughs> so so, so um, I will now open the floor given the time and uh, we have about five minutes uh, left uh, until we need to change gears to some business for either the last question or any question. So this will be like the lightning round. Anyone want to say anything? I'm going to call Donna first because she had her hand up in the very beginning. Uh, then I, I'm going to first get the people who haven't spoken at all. So I see Donna, I see David Gallup. 
Um, and Tad just, Daily Stack, please. Okay, I, okay, Tad, and anyone else? Okay, that will <coughs> probably take us through. Oh, and then Tom again. Okay, great. Donna, take it away. Um, I, this is um, hard for me to say because I, I adore Ron and his book, but there is one issue in it that uh, rubs me the wrong way as a non academician a non-politician, a mother, a grandmother, just a normal person. And it is the sentence in the table about a federation that says primary, primary loyalty is to the g central federal government while secondary loyalty to one state or province is permissible. And I think I, I understand the point, but I think that stating it in a way, in, in a different way, I mean, to me that there are a lot of people who, who that's a hard sell at this point. And, but I suggest something like individual citizens display loyalty to both their nation state and the world as a whole. The survival, health, and good of the whole must take precedence over the interest of any one nation. So that's my one comment. I mean, I don't, it, you know, I don't disagree with a point, but I think it could be nuanced a little to make it more acceptable to other mothers and grandmothers and daughters of veterans. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. And as Evan uh, points out, often that languaging of these went out. You're already. frozen again. So we have, uh, Dave, Dave. Okay. Thank you, Donna. Okay. Uh, David? Yeah, hey, so they're actually, Ron wasn't sure, but there actually is a review of his book uh, from something called um, Perspectives on Political Science. So I can try to send that to everybody. It was written by Eric Cox at that point from the Campaign for UN Reform. So there was a review of the book. Um, the next thing is, uh, from my reading, the probably the strongest argument, at least in the first couple of chapters for World Federation comes at the end of, or the middle of page 15, where he asks, does this description of any way apply to our present world community, which lacks world government? So after having had Ron had explained the, the key points of why we need government, the fact that he asked those same questions about the world community for me was so relevant as to why we need a world government uh, or why we, and we need why we need World Federation. Um, and then the next point, which I felt, at least in the first couple of chapters of the book, Ron, it wasn't really the point of Ron's book, but I feel like another point of government is to inculcate uh, a, a feeling of loyalty, like Donna was mentioning, or a feeling of community. Um, and I feel like one of the, the biggest difficulties for me with world Fe the, looking at the idea of World Federation is that it also needs to look at the idea of identity, how we see ourselves as, as human beings, as world citizens. So I think that's an important point, and I think we're starting to do that at, at CGS. We need to do that more, as, as link our humanity to government and looking at how we as humans can interact with that government and see ourselves as part of that, as a, uh, the common, under the common banner of, of world citizenship. And then the last thing is really a question for Ron, which is you know, about, the, about the question mark. And I'm wondering whether that question mark in his title was Ron's idea or whether that was his editors who said, you have to put a question mark there because if you don't, then it's like, oh, you know, it, this can't be academic because you're not questioning it. I'm, I'm sorry, David, time. I didn't give you the 30 seconds. Oh, sorry. Mark. So that I was it. Distracted. Just to get <clears throat> that question to Ron about the question mark. Great. <laughs> I'm actually going to let Ron have the last word after we have all our comments so he could, he could respond at that point. So, okay. Ted, you're up next. Thank you, Bob Flax. I, uh, I like to think I'm something of a scholar on the, uh, this idea and, and specifically the literature. So I just wanted to kind of place this book in the context of the rest of the literature. Um, I think we all know that uh, there was a, a shining moment for our movement when, our, when we were a movement in the 1940s, and there were a number of uh, great books uh, written about this concept uh, back then. But that movement largely diminished uh, in the early 1950s. And I would like to assert that of the many things that have been written in this realm since roughly 1950, there are three that really stand out as paramount to me. One is World Peace Through World Law by Grenville Clark and Louis Sohn, which really lays out this precise kinds of amendments 
to the UN Charter that would bring about a democratic federal world government. Uh, the second one is Joseph Barada's uh, masterpiece, two volumes, 700 pages, called The Politics of World Federation, which is really very much about the history of the idea uh, in the context of world politics. Uh, but Glossop's book is really the third. Um, for me, those three, uh, because Ron just does such a magnificent job of articulating the concept and examining all the angles of every particular element of the uh, concept, and I know in future book clubs we're going to talk about the objections and things. Um, I There's some other terrific books out there like Joe Schwartzberg's book, which is about medium-term stuff. Uh, like uh, like Saveda's terrific contributions, which zero in on certain angles. But I assert that since 1950, those three books are the pantheon of the history and substance of the idea of democratic federal world government. And I thank Ron Glossop for his enduring contribution. Thank you. Time. Ed, you, you got it to the second. That, that's, that was brilliant. And, and I also hear a few recommendations for future uh, club reading. Uh, on that. So thank you. Um, and then uh, last in the queue before we give it to Ron to have the final word is uh, Tom Camarilla. Uh, mine had to do with the loyalty of the armed forces is not just to the president, but also to the Constitution. That's in page 19, second paragraph, fifth line. Ron, I think that should be the loyalty should be to the Constitution primarily and preeminently, and to the president after. That's it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Ron to make any concluding comments. In the meantime, I'm going to take back the screen because I have one or two wrap-up uh, business items at the end, including scheduling our next speakers. So Ron, is there anything you want to say to wrap up this conversation? I appreciate very much, Bob, the wonderful job you've done of conducting this discussion. I really appreciate it. I also am very happy that we have so many people participating in it. It's a big boost to me to know that so many people are interested. One question that was raised that I wanted to ask answer is how about the question mark in the title? That was my idea. That was not the publisher's idea. My idea right from the beginning was this is a question that is open for debate. I want to participate in that debate, but I want to do this as a person looking at the issues and not as someone who's already committed to a point of view even before I begin. As I indicated, how did I even get interested in the World Federalist issue? It was because it was the high school debate topic. So right from the beginning, I always looked at it as an issue to be debated, but I did come to a firm conclusion for myself that we do have to have a world federation. It's exactly what we have to do to put an end to the problem of war and military spending and the whole militaristic outlook. So I do think that world federalism is the answer. But as I indicated earlier, I also came to the conclusion that in order to reach out to people, rather than starting with a conclusion, I had to start with a problem. And that's why I wrote this other book, Confronting War, and used it as a textbook when I was teaching. And because I was intending to use it as a textbook from the beginning, it was always written from the point of view of presenting different points of view and letting everyone be heard and not arguing just for one position. I hope that the World Federation book will continue to be read, but I, and on the identity issue that was raised, I think that the identity issue is extremely important, but that's exactly why I think Esperanto is so important. The main thing that causes people to have the identities that they have is the languages that they use. And 
you, when you learn your first language, that makes you a nationalist for your language. But there's no reason you can't go on and learn an additional language or two or more. And for me, one of the great values of Esperanto is that it is so easy to learn. It was designed to be easy to learn. The spoken language and the written language are completely harmonious, and that's not the true, not the case for most languages. So I think Esperanto is extremely important for world federalists. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Ron. I, I want to thank you for your, not only the book, but your participation today. <clears throat> I want to agree with Ted Daly. Uh, that I also consider this book one of the pantheon of world federalist literature. Um, so thank you again. Um, and now, yes, okay. So before I turn it over to Gail, I have just one or two quick business things. First, whoops, got to get the right button here. Um, whoops, wrong one. Hello, okay. No. <laughs> First, I want to remind people um, that although this book club is offered freely to you, um, it's not free. Even the Zoom account costs money. Uh, we just hired another administrator <clears throat> to help us with development and other administrative work. So uh, salaries cost money, and the, uh, the rent in, in Washington, D.C. costs money, et cetera, et cetera. So there are ways you can support CGS. I want to invite you to join. If you're not already a member, uh, you can donate uh, as well, and you can volunteer. We've got about 15 different teams. Uh, doing a variety of things, including producing programs. And we went out. Um, so I want we to lost you again. Her, uh, to do that. Lost me again. Okay, during the money pitch, it must be rigged. Um, well, no, it was during I'm, the volunteer. Back. It was during the volunteer pitch. So we, I think we've heard it most of okay, it. Okay, great. About so volunteering. That. Okay, and, and uh, before I turn it over to Gail, um, I just want to say, Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all, folks. And now we'll, uh, we'll go to, um, to Gail. And I'll give up my screen here. And Gail, you can set us up for next time. Good. Okay, yes. Um, well, we need to discuss the format for the remaining sessions. Um, now, Tom Hastings sent um, a schedule that would have us discuss chapters three and four on May 9. All of our meetings are the second Saturday of the month. And then when we finish discussing a book, we'll skip a month to give us time to get the next book and read it. But um, the tentative schedule would be to, um, to discuss chapters three and four next month, May 9. Now chapters three and four are the relation between law and government and the case for federal world government. And then the next two chapters after that are critique of federal world government and the world federalist responds. So, um, and we need people to volunteer to lead these sessions too, by the way. So you can think about that. And then getting seven and eight, chapters seven and eight are getting to a democratic world federation and summary and observations. Then chapter nine is an additional chapter that is not in the book that Ron wrote. And um, my understanding is the publisher um, didn't have room for it because it was already too long or something, but he sent that to us separately so we can read that as available. So maybe we could add that to the last, uh, to number seven and eight to add that and have chapter nine yeah. discussed as well. So comments Chapter about, nine was done only because of the Esperanto translation. We did not want to publish an Esperanto translation that was eight years out of date. So that's the only reason I wrote chapter nine. Oh, okay. Okay, well, comments about the proposed schedule. Gail? Yes. Gail, let, let me point out um, that people can, you know, it, it, Folks can do it the way I did it, of an individual putting out two chapters, or two people can take a chapter each and make a presentation, which may be more bite-sized for some people to take on. I, I personally recommend that we don't do more than two chapters uh, per session, 
because we're, not, we're now going to get into the rich material and the stuff we really want to discuss and debate. This was just foundational. Um, so more than that, I think we'll jam the pipeline. Thank you. Okay, other comments about the schedule. Does it seem like a sensible way to organize discussion and volunteers for any of the chapters, till totally did any of the chapters. No comments. <laughs> I, I think it's a reasonable schedule to read two at a time. I, I, and then maybe three at the end. Okay, well, you know, you guys can think about it and get back to me regarding if you're willing to lead uh, a chapter or two, uh, let me know which you prefer. Yeah. I saw a hand or two. Did, did people want to take on a chapter? Does anyone want to take on chapter three? Hand in front of the camera if you're willing to do chapter three. No. Okay, I thought I saw a hand or two. Which I think Tom, Tom Hastings' hand was up, but I don't think it was for chapter three. Tom, were you, was your hand up, Tom? Uh, yes, I just wanted to point out that there is a, a new link in, in, the e in the email chain if you want to get uh, the whole book in one, in one PDF that you can search or you can copy or you can comment on. And uh, so that's if somebody who is preparing for presenting the book wants to have a ta something from the book on the screen, they should go to that and they can copy that and put it in any slides that they want to present for uh, <clears throat> in the future. And you can also add comments to that uh, version as well. It's, it's look, look at any of the recent emails uh, with all the links you, you can get, you, you'll see one that's labeled new. Arthur? Um, first of all, Tom, uh, Tom did an extraordinary job laying that up so clearly and great instructions. Uh, unfortunately, when I opened that link following his instructions carefully, it did not allow me to comment. I could save to my Google Doc where I could make private comments, but not avoid in the comments. And I wonder if there might be some step missing, like sharing it. You said everyone can make comments. Did other people find? that it was working for them to make comments or anybody else had a problem that I found trying to get that to work. Did anybody else try to make comments and couldn't? couldn't? On the chat, I could not. No, no, no on the comments on the, on the link I was talking about. It's the you made comments on the chat, Tom Camarella. I saw your chat comment. But that's not what he's asking. Okay. Uh, comments on the book. Uh, I'll work with. Uh, <clears throat> uh, um, Let, let's try after this call and see if we. After the call. Fix, maybe with, with Melanie's help or whatever, we'll see if we can uh, uh, get that to work. Because to me, I, I somehow there's something missing in that. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll work with that with, <clears throat> with Arthur offline. <laughs> I want to make one final pitch to um, get a volunteer or two, that, that this format only works if people volunteer. You do not have to do a PowerPoint. Uh, you, you can, you know, have a, a, just a list of bullet points. You can not do anything. You can talk it and just have some notes to yourself. So I think it's really important to make this work. If someone would jump in and do a single chapter and then someone else do another chapter. or a, a CGS chapter like Southern California or St. Louis could take on a chapter and they could decide amongst themselves how they want to do it. <laughs> Tell me, Jack. Are you Who is stacking? Dave uh, Otten? Yeah. Who's stacking? Tom. Dave Otten? Dave Otten. Tell me. Yeah. Um, Dave, Dave Otten, go ahead. This is Dave Auden. I would argue against having someone make presentations on the chapter if people in, in the phone call read the chapters and look at the outline that I gave. Uh, I think we could spend most of our time in the future just uh, discussing those chapters and having Ron respond to questions. 
I think that would uh, be a better use of our time. Uh, Tom H. Stack. Yeah, that's. Uh, Donna, <laughs> go ahead, Tom. Go ahead, Tom. I, I agree. I was going to say the same thing. Tom agrees. Yeah. Everyone who agrees, raise your hand. Would you rather um, just have a discussion? Yeah, and those on the phone, if you disagree, let us know. But I, I also agree. I guess if people are reading the book, then it's better to just discuss it. <laughs> so we've decided that we will not have discussion leaders, but we no, will. no. I mean, we got to have somebody lead the discussion. It'll be chaos without a discussion leader. But as far as um, presenting about each chapter, we will leave that to people to read the book and read D Dave Otten's summary of the book. Uh, right. So Dave Otten's summary will be, in a sense, will replace the presentation summary that, that, that we've been given. Yes. Uh, Great idea. Would it help to have Tom Hastings? Would it help to have people either send questions to the group or to put comments in the uh, in in the book? If I can make comments work. No, I I I I think we should just discuss it. I think it's too hard to get everybody on the same technological plane. I think people should just come with their comments. Okay. That's my personal opinion. What do the rest of you think? If you if you think that people we should try to get prep questions ahead of time or have people write comments on the the electronic version of the book, raise your hand if you want to do what Tom's suggesting. All right. I see two. I see Jim and Tom Hastings raising their hand. Okay, Gail. Is it you're running it? You want to? Okay. Well, this we've come to the end of our meeting. So unless there are other comments or questions. Yes. Yes. Can... Gail, could you could you announce the WFI meeting on Monday night? Oh yes. There will be a WFI meeting. Um, let's see, seven thirty to nine Eastern time. So you can translate that into whatever time zone you're in and um, we'll send out the Zoom um, link and phone number and code. I understand that, you know, sometimes the Zoom, if you click on Zoom, it doesn't, re it doesn't ask for a code, but this time it did. And yeah. so the code would be for the Zoom would be the same as for the phone in case that's the case. Get Lee, was that what you were gonna say or do you that's have a- right, Yes, and uh, if there's anybody new coming on, and they all they had was the link they could not have gotten in they wouldn't have known that as i didn't know that so i was 15 minutes late because i couldn't get, i didn't have that number that i needed to put in always before you just push the link but now all of a sudden i had to have an id instead as well as a link and so if there was a newcomer and didn't know how to do that they wouldn't get on the book club so make a note of that. I'd like to announce okay. that we have a wonderful uh, uh, situation with uh, um, Tom Hastings. We, uh, we, Tom Hastings and I are trying to get everybody to uh, that's in the Model UN to write on our contest. So please look at that. We need more applications around the country. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope to see many of you at the WFI meeting on Monday. And um, a, a agenda items have been sent out, but the agenda needs to